Welcome to Yeah, I Make Games, the number one game development podcast. I'm your host, Mrs. with co-host Adam Pipe. Brogan's not able to join due to scheduling conflicts and stuff. Today, we're joined by Polymars. Uh, what do you do, Polymars? Yeah, I make games. Give a quick like intro on what you do. You're YouTuber and streamer and game developer. Yeah, I guess I make videos about game development. Right now, a big thing I've been doing is like streaming game development challenges on Twitch about like every week or so, and then I turn those into YouTube videos. So I'll do stuff like ooh, like learning how to make a game in a tool in like one hour, or I like remaking games from memory. Just fun stuff like that, trying to make like, I guess, game dev like entertainment content. So you do a lot of streaming, right? How is like streaming versus YouTube? What do you think? I think it's definitely a big reason I enjoy streaming compared to like when I was just doing YouTube videos is like, there's a lot more room, I think, to just kind of like be like authentic and be genuine, which I feel like is a big thing I didn't have in my videos before that. I felt like I'm just like reading a script. I would add in some jokes, but it's very like robotic. I feel that way about a lot of game dev videos, like people don't really put their personality into it a lot of the times. There might be some like scripted jokes or like scripted conversations, but I think the live stream format for game dev is really interesting because you can capture a lot of the more authentic challenges of making a game and it's pretty easy to incorporate it with that. Yeah, I haven't seen any of your streams because I'm a fake fan, but <laughs> I would assume that so much of doing games is so like utterly boring, like you can't stream it. <laughs> That's definitely a big challenge. I think my streams like get a lot lower actual live viewership than my videos do where I like recap the streams. And I think a big reason for that is like one, like all the coding process. But I've also like, I purposely try to like do stream ideas that I think make for interesting streams. So I'll try out like visual programming languages. Like I'll do a lot of scratch stuff. Or I did a stream where I made a game with like chat GPT, which was nice because there was like very little actual coding. It was pretty fun to watch and stuff like that. I saw your video on, on doing a horror game in one hour. Was that on the stream? Oh, Oh, yes. Yeah, that was from a stream. And that was nice because I made like the horror game controller ahead of time for like a past project. Oh, smart. Yeah, I basically just one cheated <laughs> so I could make the game in an hour. <laughs> and two, it made the stream a lot more interesting because it was just like modeling stuff, like building the environment in Unity making sound effects, the actual fun stuff to watch. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. You can kind of plan a game dev theme like you would a show or something. Yeah, yeah, that's the I, that's the part I really like about it. And I still have like a lot to learn, I think, when it comes to that, but like, it's like super fun. Well, I noticed you're getting a lot of views on your second channel, just like live stream recaps, so it's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's gotten really crazy. I think it's definitely like compared to my main channel, it's a lot, it appeals to like a way broader audience, I feel like. And it seems like, is it less work, do you think, than main channel stuff? Yeah, I'd say it's a lot more like, off hands for me uh, because I have like an editor edit together the stream stuff. So you usually for me, a lot of it's just like just the live streams, which is really nice. I'll stream for like a couple of hours mm -hmm. and then have someone turn into a video. As I've been doing that, it's getting more and more off hands, I think, as I like work with more editors and kind of get better at that process. Yeah, I tried this year, I tried doing a few weeks of like daily streams of game dev and I'm like, now I'm burnt out and I'm just like, this isn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like focusing on working too hard. Yeah, to be fair, I'm like very inconsistent still. I may, I might stream like once a week for the most part. I don't know how people stream. Like I, I, even for game dev streamers, I'll see people stream like like four or five hours every day. I feel like some people just do it. I mean, that's what I heard. Some people just do it kind of because they want to be productive and not scroll Twitter. So they kind of, I'll put like a camera on me so I can't, you know. Mm -hmm. But like, they're probably not very fun streams to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Last like December, I was streaming, uh, working on my final project for one of my computer science classes because otherwise I just had no motivation to work on it. It worked out well. It was like a game engines class. So it was like surprisingly fitting. But it was the only way to get me to do my homework was to stream it. <laughs> Life of a YouTuber. <laughs> so, so hard, so hard. Can we ask what's like financial stuff? Like how much money you make from this? I think it's kind of like growing at the moment. I think um, I'd say 
average is like if I post like a video every week, each one gets like 200, like thousand views. So it's usually somewhere from like three to like 5k a month from the second channel. And then yeah, that's something I'm trying to like grow uh, right now. I think it'd be cool to like work with like sponsors and stuff too and that kind of thing um, i mean the easiest thing is just to be your own sponsor and make a course it's so always <laughs> just make your own courses it's so easy i know we talked about that before like the udemy courses and like there's so many things you can do with that you just make something like really quick only takes a few days to make i gotta get on that i always say that i feel like coming up with an idea is like the hard part for me i feel like there's not like i can't think of something that specific that i feel like I could add any value to. Mm -hmm. You could do a course on how to make like a hit H.I.O. horror game in an hour. True, actually. <laughs> I, I could sell my horror game controller and just have people swap out the assets and instantly go viral. Yeah, Adam, I saw you're doing like games people can commission you to make a game. How's that going? I got like quite a few responses. I'm pretty surprised. Oh, nice. I'm always like shocked at the fact that people have money. And <laughs> I mean, I got mostly youtubers actually commissioning uh -huh. me to make games oh that's interesting i guess that's my market so uh hello my market anyways uh i got like uh, i think like 10 responses 10 people submitting so like i'm now like doing them like one by one but i actually do not have that much time to do commissions i only have like a month or two left until i start work on my next game i was just like oh, i'll do commission but then uh, there's like actual interest but it's cool you know i feel like i definitely lowballed myself super hard i mean everyone keeps selling me but i kind of wanted to do like a very low amount to see what like the interest is to begin with yeah you know um although i feel like most of the people that commissioned me they're kind of people with money anyways so they're kind of i think they would have commissioned me as well if it was more and like almost nobody commissioned me for the small game Almost everyone commissioned me for the regular game. 1,800. 1,800, yeah, for the regular game, which is a bargain. But it takes me about a week to make, so it should it should be the same rate yeah. as I do freelance, so it should be fine. That's really interesting. I've always wondered, like, what the demographic would be, like, who would be interested in that. I guess YouTubers make sense. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, one part of it. There's also the first commission I'm doing... Is a, it's a streamer who wants to basically have like an interactive overlay for his stream. So I, I kind of make like the thing and I make sure that like a big part of it is like magenta or whatever so he can chroma key it out and then it's like an interactive thing for his stream, which is pretty cute. Oh, that is cool, yeah. Yeah, and there's also like one company kind of that was like, they're working on like an app with a bunch of mini games and so they commissioned me to do a mini game for their app. But this one is like very organized. They just gave me like pitch deck of what I need to do. So they definitely ask more people than just me. A whole, whole bunch of stuff like that. But I've, I've only, you know, reached out to people yet. I haven't actually started work on any of the games yet. But I'm I'm just happy there's like an, a market. Like even if it's a small one that there is a market for this. Because in my mind it always sounded really cool. But I feel like no one has ever even like attempted to do game dev commissions. Or like no, at least not publicly, you know. I know some people that are like, you have been approached to be like, can you game make a game for me? This I've heard. But people that are just like, I will make games now, like commission me. It's kind of unheard of. So definitely changing the industry here. <laughs> game changer. No, that's really cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll update you on how it goes. Yeah, there's some on Fiverr, but I mean, it's like really cheap. I'm like, what? What's kind of insane about the thing I'm trying to do is I really want to make like, you know, fresh games every time. So I make like all the assets from Sketch and all the code from Sketch. I don't use any templates or anything. Yeah. And all the Fiverr ones, it's literally like they ask like 500 to 800, you know, as a minimum minimum fee. And it's basically just an asset flip. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel like going on Fiverr, you go in with like really low expectations. <laughs> you also just have a really low budget. That's kind of what it's there for. Yeah, I don't know. I, th I don't really know how much I should actually ask for stuff like this. Because I'm kind of, I'm going to start soon on a new project, which will take up like all of my time. But maybe like uh, I'll have some time in between somewhere to try this again. And then if I try it again, I might try and do like much higher amount and see if anyone bites. I, f I feel like also it's kind of hard maybe to get to reach the, the people and stuff. I feel like maybe once I do a few commissions, people are, will maybe be like, oh, wow, this is real, you know? Right, right.
First of all, I gotta read the room here. How much do we hate AI in this chat? I don't know. I know like a very little. Barely messed with it. I just saw it and I was like, I don't really have any use for this. So then I just ignored it. Yeah, I kind of got into it a bit early before people started freaking out about it. So to me, it's always been like, well, the computer can say things. This is so cool. <laughs> and I was just really excited for a while. Finally, like a thing that can make textures for me that are better than the textures from textures.com. <laughs> so this is like how I'm excited about it. Obviously all of like the AI art stuff where it's like, oh, I'm going to not pay an artist and do like stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like stolen database. So I don't think it's like ethical or anything, but I feel like, I mean, I've been using it like loads already AI. Like almost all of my games now have like loads of textures that are AI generated, but they're so low key. People would never even know what was AI generated. I do like a, a very subtle paper texture in the background is AI generated. That's like fine, I think, I hope. I don't think Twitter will kill me over this one. <laughs> anyway, it's like, I feel like in AI news now, you know, there's like GPT-4 and everything and it's getting, it's all getting like pretty good and it's all getting like pretty mainstream and stuff. Yeah, I think there's definitely a few like AI tools that have become like very like integrated into like my workflow. I feel like chat GPT, I kind of use as like a, a personal assistant now. Just very slowly, I started using it more and more. And now it's like whenever I have a question or I want to like reformat something, I'll just ask it to do like literally anything, which has been like pretty crazy. The demo they gave of um of GPT-4, like the API, which isn't available yet, it can do like, it can like read images and stuff. One of the examples they gave is where like someone drew like a mock-up of a website on paper. And then they gave that and was like, make this a real website. And it kind of did it. And honestly, that's super cool because I think a big part of like the AI hype for me and like what I use ChatGPT for as well is just like there's so many like small things that I could do if I knew more how to code, <laughs> you know, doing like the command prompt uh, stuff to rename files and stuff. And this is this is what ChatGPT is super, super good for because you can just be like, wow, I have this problem kind of and I know I can probably do it better. Can you just like write the the code for me to do it. Yeah, I've done that before with like Python scripts and stuff. For me, like ChatGPT has kind of just replaced like Google for a lot of things that I used to like look up. For what I've used it for, for coding, it's like always been like consistently like really good. It's crazy. AI art, uh, I think a few of like my like thumbnails just as a test, I tried using like Dali for some like thumbnail stuff, which was pretty cool. But I haven't had like a huge use case for like AI art. Besides, like, gimmicky stuff, I did, like, videos where I tried to make a game in AI and that kind of thing. There's a new, like, text-to-speech AI. It's, like, Eleven Labs. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it's, like, really, really realistic. I'm sure there's a lot of, like, use cases for that when it comes to YouTube and stuff. It's also super good for making guttural sounds. If you just type, like, random things, it does, like, perfect screams. It's really good. Oh, that's really cool. I gotta note that. What is this? Eleven Labs? Yeah, I love going on this website, turning, like, the voice stability to like zero and just it does the most crazy stuff what i think is really cool about the speech senses is is it's kind of it knows kind of what it's talking about so if you do like uh the guy says hello in a tiny voice he will like say the quote in a tiny voice like it's really interesting but honestly it's so good to use in games but i feel so often every time a new ai thing comes out i'm like i could make a game about this but then again i could also just pay a voice actor so yeah 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 it's always like the double double edged thing i like the idea of just using it to make like weird stuff that people can't do like sounds and weird stuff using it for textures like paper text just like all the small things and stuff that you need in a game that like I feel like half the time with like textures.com, I'm like, I'll use this texture, but I'm not sure if the license is actually what it says it is or something like you never quite know. And it's just like legally, I'm just, I don't know if I can actually use this or not. I mean, I guess the same thing's coming up with like AI art, but there's no way I doubt if you generate a paper texture and put it in your game, someone's going to track it down and be like, that came from this, which came from this image and is actually illegal. Massive lawsuit. Exactly. And I, I even feel this way about like non-AI generated art. Sometimes you use something so like low-key is like you could potentially get away with it. Because like who the hell is going to be like, wow, that texture of a paperclip, that's my <laughs> yeah. paperclip. I'm going to sue you now. <laughs> I was playing Bubdy recently. It's a really, it's a really weird game, but it uses like AI art kind of in a shit post way, because there's all like signs pointing towards like things, but 
<laughs> AI is super bad at doing text. So like the signs pointing towards the train station, but it's AI generated, so it all says like train soon or something. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really good. Doing stuff like that is really interesting. Yeah, it's it's really good at drawing like beautifully rendered girls or whatever, but it's like <laughs> really it's really not as good as doing textures, you know? Like some textures are really good, but if you want to do like something specific, like oh give me like a concrete texture but the bottom half is like, you know, kind of I don't know, cement, I don't know. It's kind of struggling, which is stupid because this is what I actually want to use it for, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. I've noticed that with like AI, like image generation too. Like, if you do something basic, like it can do it pretty well. But like the second you try to do something just like kind of random, it just usually turns out pretty bad. Yeah, even with like simple stuff, like I can ask it to generate like a brown dirt texture and it'll work okay. But if I say like a purple dirt texture, just like doesn't know what I'm saying. Another thing that I use is this, there's a site called like calligrapher.io and you type in text and it returns like a realistic like handwriting as if someone drew it. And I've used that in a few games now for like, if I want to like have like a handwritten like, like texture or something like that, but I don't want to draw it myself and a font just doesn't look good enough. I'll use that tool. It's become like, so it's like a, such like a specific thing, but it's become so useful for me. That's really cool. Have you seen her? Like the movie about the guy that dates the AI. There's a scene because like the job he does is he writes pers personal letters for people in the future job market, whatever. He just dictates the thing and then like the computer makes like like it look like it's handwritten. So we're already at this stage. This is pretty crazy. <laughs> it's becoming real. Definitely the AI I use the most is GitHub Copilot though. 60% of the code I write now is just by that AI. Oh, that's crazy. I actually haven't, uh, I haven't really checked it out too much. I'm just scared that like, I'm gonna start to use it and then not be able to like turn it off. I'll get like way <laughs> too used to it. It's really, it's just really super powerful. 50% of the time it knows what you were about to write. Not that it's like super crazy, you know, prediction of like uh, your intent, but it's, you know, you start writing like right, a, right. a lerp or something and it knows you're writing a lerp so it just finishes for you. Which just speeds up like the coding part of game making games so much. Yeah, that is really nice. And I feel actually, honestly, going back into the streams thing, I think if you turned on GitHub Copilot, you could make the bo the coding part much quicker. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I feel like I'm missing out now. I haven't used any of this stuff. I think the main thing for me is just it's hard to get over the inertia of like I have a good workflow, it goes quick. I don't want to spend time learning when I could just finish making this thing or something i'm like uh, i just it'll take me this long to make the game it'll take me this long to learn this new thing i don't know if it's going to save me any time so i'll just keep making the thing but i've seen like an article recently by tyler glail the guy who works on eugenics that you see it it's a really good example of like because there's so much hype with this ai stuff you every now and then you have like a post of like ai is gaining sentience i asked it if it was if it wasn't to kill me and it said yes you know um <laughs> which is so stupid but it's like good at just doing like stuff that's already been done but if it's really like a too novel idea it just fumbles it back every time What's everyone's favorite algorithm you've invented for one of your games? So for a school project last semester, I was working on like a 2D game engine for like around three months, I think. And it was really cool to just be able to come up with solutions for different issues that just come up when like, uh, I guess like designing like a big game engine architecture. And then after that, I realized like, oh, wait, this is just like the same thing as this like Unity component. Like that, that's why it exists like this. Something that specifically stood out to me, it wasn't really something I invented, I guess, but that I enjoyed implementing was behavior trees, which I guess if anyone watching doesn't know what they are, it's like a structure for like NPC and enemy behavior where you can have like sequences of nodes, like if the player is near attack and those branch from a parent. And then if that sequence fails, it moves on to the next sequence, which could be like run toward the player. And then you can nest those to represent pretty much anything. And they're really easy to like modify and um, expand or whatever. And I don't know, I just found it really cool to be able to generalize something that was like as seemingly complicated as like enemy behavior. Maybe it's not that crazy, but I guess I was mostly surprised to learn about it because that doesn't exist in Unity for some reason. But I know it's like a thing in Unreal. I guess one thing that's kind of cool to me is that someone just like invented that 
and then now it's just kind of one of like the standard solutions or whatever like what other solutions are so ingrained into the game industry that could just be completely reworked and like made better that people just haven't thought of yet i don't know i don't know i've I've never been a fan of behavior trees i don't know i've always been on team state machine yeah i mean to be fair same here because most of my projects are like really small where it doesn't really make sense to use a behavior tree but maybe if i ever worked on something bigger in school we literally spent like half a semester learning how to implement behavior trees and the entire time was just like i'm never going to use this for a game (laughs) (laughs) Have you seen the PDF or the talk from Fear, their AI? They had like really good AI in it. A lot of people were talking about it. I know like a big game that was like uh, known for it was like Halo 2 as well. I think that might have been the game that like popularized it. I feel like Half-Life probably does it as well. Half-Life is like famous for its like overly complex AI. It's such, honestly, like you could not get away like making a game like that these days. Because it's such, it's such a like shitpost way of making a game. <laughs> the enemies are just way too smart um, and way too good. And they really place them at like horrible places. It's like you enter a door and the enemy is behind you and kills you instantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like a joke, kind of. And then like the way to beat the game is like you perfectly memorize what every person is going to do at what exact time. Um, so you do like a perfect John Wick style execution of the map, um, and this is the only way to actually beat the game. <laughs> yeah, that that would not fly nowadays. I don't. Think. I don't think so too, right? But it's crazy that that was like the the most popular like shooter game so many years ago. Uh, I recently saw like a, a Twitter thread about it about like a lot of like stuff that triple A games used to do, and then like now we don't do it anymore, but just because they used to do it. I kind of like, I guess this is an example. I mean, it would not fly these days, but does it mean it's like a bad game design choice? I don't know. Yeah, I feel like a big thing that like has phased out is like live system. I remember, uh, I think Sonic Mania, because it's like a classic Sonic game, like when that game came out, they had lives and people really hated it. They're like, why do you have to like restart like the entire like zone when you die in the last level? <laughs> I'm like, wow, like I guess the like, people had no problem with that back in the day, but... I don't know if it's a better decision or not, but I mean, I'm kind of bad at games, so I kind of like modern games. You die and you go back like two seconds ago. Losing progress isn't very fun. I don't know. In a way, it works so well. I went to an arcade recently, and I've never really gone to arcades. It's really insane how addicting it is to do like do something and just instantly fail and die, and it's stupid. And instead of losing all of your progress, you put in a coin. Right, right originated from like lack of like save like systems originally yeah because i know like i'm sure if if you didn't game over it i'm sure like older games you get you get really far in them and then if you had to like reset for some reason it would be like way more frustrating i feel like the idea is you make the game shorter but just hard so like your save system is in how good you can play the levels or something a lot of the live systems just came from arcades because they were just designed to get as many quarters from you as possible oh true and yeah they just kind of influence console games also, like, what happened to, like, linear games? It's, every game is, like, a little bit open world these days. <laughs> it's so <Yeah>. stupid. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Favorite algorithm? I've never made an actual good, like, branching dialogue system, but I always like to, like, make that stuff. And I always do, like, a very basic thing, and then my game gets bigger, and then I have to, I have a horrible system. But I've kind of figured it out now that, like, <clears throat> you just make, like, this huge package every time of, like, all the things I do per line, you know, this is the person that says it and the person he's talking to and the camera and whatever and stuff. And um, that's kind of a cool thing because then you can like direct like a whole scene with just like dialogue. And I feel like if you, you, you make your dialogue system like as expandable to that level, it kind of becomes like Turing complete. And then if you have like a flex system, you can make like an entire RPG with just a dialogue system. And like a safe system wait that's so cool i absolutely like love stuff like that just making the most generic solution possible for something i just never have the chance to do it because all my games are like so small <laughs> true and it's kind of that's i think that's kind of cool about making a big game and especially if you really start paying attention to a lot of big bigger games like um especially older bigger games like ace attorney for example it's really just one really fancy juicy dialogue system And the entire game is just, like, content added to that dialogue system. There's, like, nothing else in there, pretty much. Which is so insane, really, if you think about it. Morrowind's, like, half dialogue system, I would say. 
actually games are just like books that go forward when you press a button. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> you just have to press the right button. Maybe one day they'll make AI that press the button for you so you can just read. That's a genius startup idea. Yeah. <laughs> I have seen one guy doing like a prototype of an AI for a game generation where it's like instead of like you know because all the eyes nowadays it's like oh i will make the code for the game you know um but that doesn't really work but the ai they proposed is like you start with a screenshot and then the ai like predicts the next frame based on your input and i think honestly there's so much potential in this and it's really scary, I think. Because <laughs> if they get good at this, then, then we are done for, I think. That kind of stuff is, like, actually crazy. Because it's like, what if games just become completely AI-generated? Or what if anyone could just type in what they want to play and you don't, you don't even have to buy games? Yeah, true. Because, like, if you think about it, what is a game if not, you know, predicting the next frame based on your inputs, you know? When I was little, that's how I thought games were made. I thought like you had to make every single possible frame, like draw them. <laughs> I thought that too. Yeah. yeah, I was like, whoa! They had they had to do so many drawings. <laughs> and for movies, so many photographs. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So hurry up and get rich now while you still can, and then, then when our jobs are gone, then we're set. It doesn't matter. Too. I really just wish they made the AI just for me. And then people would yeah. commission me to make a game. I'd give them the AI-generated game, and they wouldn't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I always see uh, these, like, Fiverr or, like, Upwork posts where it's like, I'll I'll draw you as a Simpsons character or something. And they literally just take your picture and they put it into, like, Dolly. <laughs> they, they have these, like, crazy side hustles. I'm like, okay, this is really questionable. The amount of YouTube thumbnails I've seen of, like, I've made 10,000 in a day using AI, you know. <laughs> and they all do, like, something like that. It's, like, it's really weird. I guess they're just, it's taking advantage of the fact that not many people know about it yet. I'm sure in, like, two, three years, that's not going to work anymore. I'll talk about my favorite algorithm. I don't know, implementation thing. I was just going to say endoparasitic shadow system was pretty fun because I wanted to come up with a shadow system that wasn't just generic 2D lighting, you know, with like, uh, I don't know how it is, ray casting or something. The lines go out from the center of the character and then it just like draws polygons over the dark spots or whatever. I just came up with a system where it covers the screen in um, circles and then it just hides the ones that are visible from the player and it fades them out over time. So it kind of makes this like slow organic feel i guess where it like slowly decays the shadows out in and out yeah i don't know i enjoy like taking kind of like a common thing like let's take a shadow system and then how do i make it weird like i was thinking about how you could do that in 3d and just like put a bunch of blobs everywhere and it's like oh this part's in shadow so it's just covered in a bunch of blobs and if you go move a light over there they disappear and then when you step away they fade back in or something and kind of it's not realistic but it just feels weird kind of that really reminds me of a game idea I once had where it's like a multiplayer shooter, but there's no HUD. You can only see the player by like looking at the players, you know? Um, but the whole twist is that like everything that's in shadow is completely black. As long as you're in a shadow, you're like practically invisible to other players, but you can't see anything, kind of. I think that would be interesting. Cause kinda, and then the idea, I think, would be is that like um, every time you shoot, you make a lot of light. And uh, every time you uh, pick up, or like maybe the guns have light, so you have to like kind of throw the guns away and grab them at the right time if you see someone, you know. Some st- stuff like that, that would be really interesting, I think. God, I wish I could make multiplayer games. <laughs> Wait, yeah, that's sick. I could see that being like a really fun game. I really like playing like CSGO with like one other guy and then like turning off the HUD and just being scared, and then, like, suddenly you see him from the corner. Oh. Oh, yeah. It seems like this is the AI episode, so let's bring this back to AI. Could an AI do it, come up with that on its own? Because it seems like so much of it is just rehashing existing ideas. At the very least, I think an AI would not be able to, like, design that. Like, you have to be very, like, like, you need, like, a human to come up with that. Maybe if you're very specific, but I don't know. I don't know, though. Like, the... Making shadows uh, 100% black is not something that I I think 
I don't know, an, a, like a shader code for that on the internet. I don't think it exists much. So I don't think the AI would be able to come up with it. If you're very specific in telling it what to do, then that means you're doing, you're coming up with the idea though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Will we get to a point where you can tell it to be like, come up with a completely new idea no one's ever thought of before. That's also fun. Yeah, true. <laughs> I think that, that prompt would just break any AI. <laughs> I don't know. The, I heard like the number one problem with AI because kind of what they've been doing, they've really been like not improving the technology much. It's just been like, oh, what if we throw even bigger data at this thing every time? I don't know. I had heard a podcast with like an AI skeptic kind of guy and he was like, the problem is it's never deriving any of the things it says from like ground truth. It's always like deriving it from next possible word. And I think this is why it's so bad at making actual like novel inventions or novel ideas. So the current structure of AI just seems like it's good for tools and stuff and like it helps helps you for making things. I'm absolutely not like an AI doomer. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> yeah. I really don't think it's gonna replace many people's jobs because all the people's jobs it's gonna replace, those people are still gonna be are gonna be just the ones using those tools, you know. So I don't know. It's not gonna do anything autonomously at any point. Hopefully for for our sake. I was talking with a friend about this today but apparently like a lot of like the top like your coding job or just like average coding jobs like 70 percent or something of the people that apply apparently don't really know how to code that well a lot of college graduates that get off of like computer science school the example was like the fizzbuzz algorithm where it's like if it's a three it says fizz and if it's a multiple of nine it says buzz and if it's both, it says FizzBuzz. On actual like coding tests, like if they do this one, 60% of the people that apply actually don't know how to do it. That's what uh, bothers me about like being a comp sci majors. I feel like there are like very few people I feel like who are actually have like any remote interest in programming. I feel like games like really does like weed out like only the most like passionate people just because. Because it's really hard. No one's gonna be working in games for like the salary or whatever. Yeah, a previous guest we had who worked at Google said the same thing that like the work at Google was so much easier than like the indie game she's making now. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point games you only get the most passionate people i mean i'm sure there's some people who are like we're gonna make a game that's change the world make so much money it's gonna be the next flappy bird or something oh definitely yeah i think yeah. this is this is at least 60 percent of the industry i would think mobile like triple a spaces i feel like are a lot more like market driven and then i feel like that's like less of a thing with indie games which is weird i feel like a lot of indie games are just like genuinely just like some solo developer like wanting to just make some game that they would play maybe that's why most indie games like like, 99% of indie games don't, like, sell or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe we need a little bit more market-driven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe a few more business-driven people. The Venn diagram of people who, like, you know, seeking out pitching opportunities to capitalist inventors, whatever, and the other circle of, like, people that like to make video games, like the actual code, I think it's not a lot of overlap. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, which is, like, a shame. But yeah, it's interesting because I feel like I haven't, I've never even been, like, that much of a gamer, so I always wonder, like, why do I like games so much? Like, why do I like, like, game dev community? But I kind of realize now, I think that's why, just, like, that everyone here is, like, genuinely, I think has like a passion for like whatever it is like programming or whatever yeah because i never really enjoyed i feel like hanging out with like tech bros at all yeah <laughs> and i guess it was because nobody was like passionate about like programming and stuff it's just like how much money can we make how can we like make the next big thing and do our startup or whatever and it's like just make something cool for once. Every time I meet like a programmer and I say I make games, they they're always like, "Oh, so what is your like? What language do you use?" And I'm like, "Oh, brother." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel so like disconnected from like a lot of like like tech bro people because the the conversations they'll have will be about things that I like, don't care about. Like I don't care about like oh like what what's your favorite programming language or like what what's your favorite React library? I'm like. I don't think, like, to me, just none of that matters. I don't know. My favorite programming language is the only one I can use to make the games, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like, I want to use this tool and it requires this language. I'll learn that language. It's like, I don't really care what it is. I just want to, like, make things. And now, thankfully, with ChatGPT, you don't have to learn the language. <laughs> I feel like if ChatGPT was a thing when I was trying to learn how to code, I would have never learned how to code, honestly. <laughs> so I'm, I am worried for our, our future generations.
I wonder if there are like many potentially future game developers that never got there because now they're like, oh, I want to make a video game instead of like downloading a tutorial. They're like, I'll just shut GPT, make me a video game right now. <laughs> we'll see. I'm sure it'll all work out. How important do you think like programming is to solo game development? Codeless tools are becoming more and more popular. Like there's like Unity Bolt and Blueprints and then also like all the AI coding tools that we've talked about. So I think the barrier for entry has gotten lower. I wonder if we've like reached a point where programming skills have become like not vital for solo game developers. Maybe not yet. Cause I think like, like we were saying like that deep level of customization and addressing like unique challenges probably requires like a decent grasp of at least like some like coding principles. I don't know if that will be the case, like uh, like in like a few years or something. I think there's like two answers. It's like first of all, I think you know like we've established the AI is actually not good good at like coming up with new things. So you kind of like, actually need to just tell it what you already know how to code. And I think this is true for a lot of the no code stuff. Maybe I feel like it's more about like. For me, programming anyway, it's because like when I tried Unreal Engine and I didn't like the blueprints, not because it's bad, but just because it's slower than coding the thing. Especially when I was starting out, I thought like, you know, the real artistry in making the game is being a game designer and the coder is just the guy who implements it all. But now like making games and, and learning how to have code and stuff, I feel like the actual artistry of making the game is the actual, like, the code itself, like, the actual implementation of the things. Because you make, like, so many, like, thousands of micro decisions about how the player moves and stuff and stuff like this. And this is, like, the actual kind of game design in a way. Right, right. Even if the game designer does, like, the macro game design, like, the micro game design is where it, like, the real juices add, I think. And this, this you do with code. I think that's a good point. I didn't, I never thought about that, but I think, like, program, like, game programming and, like, design, like, have to be pretty intertwined just because of those, like, really fine details. The no-code stuff, there's some really cool stuff, but it's, like, as long as it's not, like, faster than just writing the code, and as detailed as writing the code, I don't think it's ever going to truly replace it. It's always going to be like the, maybe like the entry point into making games. And then like when you really want to make something good, you kind of learn how to code. Because I don't know, it's not super hard. Why fix what ain't broke, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. still a very efficient way to tell the computer how to do a thing, if you think about it. I just recently tried for the first time doing like visual shader editing, and the node graph and all that. I'd never done before and then I, I like followed some tutorial and did it and was like oh that's cool and then I went back to writing shader code because it's like it's so much more concise I feel like it's like I can just write write out the you know the variable write out this write a couple lines I'm done where the shader graph I have to put like 20 nodes out or something and then like scan through it and I'm like because I guess because I'm already used to it it just feels quicker and more concise to actually just write it out and have it there written concisely and it's easier to like look at later on down the road and understand. But I, yeah, it is cool as like a beginner tool. I don't know, do we know anyone who's like started with that, made some games with that, and then got into programming? I, t I technically did. When I started making games in Game Maker, I did the drag and drop stuff first. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know. Game Maker has drag and drop. That's cool. It has drag and drop, yeah. How is it like comparatively? It's definitely more bare bones. I feel like it's not as feature complete or anything. So it's definitely, I feel like that first two tutorials, if you do like the built-in tutorials, at least in the old Game Maker, where like this is all drag and drop, and then it's like, okay, time to learn how to code. I agree. As someone who uses Scratch a lot, it's just very, it's very tedious, I feel like. But I think what's interesting to me is like, I feel like there isn't actually as big of a difference between like text and like visual coding as like a lot of people like think. Like, I feel like especially Scratch, like I was surprised when I started to use it more for like in my videos and things. I'm like, wait, this is just like coding in any other programming language. It's just you can't like have any syntax errors. A lot of people have like the mental barrier, I think, from going from like visual stuff to like actually like typing code. I guess as someone who like does like both, like I feel like there's really not that much of a difference, which is interesting. Uh, the whole code, no code thing is kind of like, if we t put the AI stuff aside, it's really nothing more than just another translation of code. At a certain point, Either, you know, if you really want to simplify it more, either, you know, you get rid of some of the d detailed control you have. 
instead of like being able to have a block to change the x variable and add it on velocity you have like a block that's like movement but then like a lot of a lot of it is lost because you can't fine tune the movement as much you know and you can't do any other movement than that block you know it's always going to be something like this and then the other side is the ai code thing again you just give up a lot of control for like let the ai do the part for me so I don't know. I don't think I don't think programming is ever truly going to go away, but I think all the no-code stuff is a good way to get into it for a lot of people. Something I like about I guess like the tools like RPG Maker and stuff is it's like if you're wanting to make this kind of game, it's like I want to make a classic JRPG, and it's like I can do everything. I don't know how to program, but I know you know I'm a good writer or we got a good artist, and like this is the kind of game we want to make. Here's the tool that just lets you immediately make that, and then you can do the parts you actually want to do. You don't have to learn how to program and stuff. You can just do the story and the um, the art and all that. And it's like, it makes sense for people who want to do like, I want to do a game that already exists, but like my own style or something. It's kind of dumb to have to remake the wheel every time when it's like, you already know the base mechanic. The mechanics already exist. So you're just doing story or whatever and like a mod or something, you know, of that kind of thing. And it's, yeah, I think that's pretty cool just for like, I mean, especially like modding and stuff. It's like how many cool things have come out of like, doom mods where it's just like we reskin everything and put in a new story or something and then it's a fresh game basically and it's like that's you know a lot of people just want to do that that's very true and that's that's super valid as well i think as like you know serious game developers whatever we, we tend to sometimes forget that you know some of the stuff you know made in sketch and the stuff made in like little editors and twine and whatever and stuff I mean, that's also like real games, and <clears throat> quite often people make stuff in that that's better than Unity games, <laughs> on average, I would say. I don't know, maybe it's just a different medium, in a way. Yeah, yeah. I think there's like a huge like stigma around like visual programming stuff, especially like Scratch. And I remember when I was little in middle school, I think I would have really benefited from like using Scratch. I would have probably learned how to code a lot quicker. But I just thought like, oh, like Scratch isn't like real coding. I'm not a baby. I don't need this. Um, <laughs> so I think like that's like something that I really want to try to do with my videos is just like make like stuff like that cool, make people interested in that kind of stuff, especially like younger people who want to get into coding. Because I feel like personally, I think it's one of the best ways to like learn like programming concepts is like Scratch and stuff like that. It's a great learning tool. And also I have like, I feel like double about this because like on one hand all of the no code stuff and just the alternative game maker things like the zx spectrum and whatever and stuff i don't know it's like valid games in and by itself but the other thing is i'm also always worried that it might be like i know there's like this one like artist and i think it's like a really old guy and he once got you know like a computer for himself and he f discovered paint and just started making like artworks on it and he's like he's still doing it it's more like because he just doesn't know it's like not knowing that the film yeah. bucket exists, you know. And <laughs> just being like, this works for me, I'll just I'll just go with this flow for the rest of my life, you know. And the main thing in our industry, there's so many people that have like sunk costs into engines. Almost everyone who uses Game Maker for like a professional commercial game, no disrespect Game Maker, but a lot of them are just like, <laughs> I don't know, I've already been working on this game for eight years, I can't stop now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've, like, never thought that. That's such a good point. That was, like, me with... I used, like, Sony Vegas to edit my videos for so long. <laughs> it's such a terrible software. And, like, everyone I knew, every, like, YouTuber was telling me, like, switch to Premiere. Like, it's not that much work. But I'm like, oh, I have to learn a whole new software. And, like, one day I just, like, opened Premiere. I use it for, like, a day. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, like, so much easier to do anything. <laughs> I think people need to just get over that, like, I guess, like, block but like i can relate to that a lot where you just get comfortable with something but i think everyone is guilty of this i still pay like fucking thousands of euros every year for 3ds max although i know oh, yeah. in every bone in my body that bladder <laughs> is better in every single way <laughs> yes yes but also weirdly enough i still use gimp even though i have like the creative <laughs> cloud suite so i should use photoshop but like every time i open photoshop it's like slower and i feel like there's more options i just like okay i'll go back to gimp so i still have the issue uh i've been using davinci resolve though it's free oh yeah i think davinci is like definitely better like on par with premiere as long as you're not using vegas it's, it's all good <laughs> no nobody use vegas that's good that's go crazy though because i remember when i was like 12 years old i wanted to get into making youtube videos and i feel like at that time everyone was saying like yeah use sony vegas pro it's the <laughs> 
the main thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I was like 14 and I wanted to like post a like a video on like a YouTube channel. So I looked up like because Sony Vegas was just like the one I knew. So I looked up like Sony Vegas like crack free download or whatever. <laughs> and then I just stuck with that for so long. Then like next thing you know, I'm like I don't know. I'm like midway through like high school, like making these like really complicated videos, and I'm still like using the worst software in the world from like 2014. You still use Vegas Pro? Are you still using the same crack for when you were 14? <laughs> <laughs> I would never ever pirate a software in my life. <laughs> okay, your IRS agent was listening, but you do dodged that bullet. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> never, guys. I built my channel while using a laptop with Linux on it, so I had to deal with the hell of Linux video editors for like over a year, <laughs> and it was so bad. There's nothing. There's nothing that works good on it. Oh, that's crazy. Maybe it's changed. But... Linux is maybe like the ultimate sunk cost. <laughs> <laughs> they got so used to like using the terminal for everything and they're so good at it now that like they don't want to stop because they feel so cool you know that's so true don't use linux i used it for two years starting in college and it's not worth it <laughs> just if you want to get anything done just use windows or mac <laughs> like the compatibility puts me off from it oh my god yeah i've talked to people that are so deep into linux they're like Oh, this web page really wants me to use their CSS. I really don't want to. Why can't I just read the <laughs> yeah. HTML? And it's like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I have friends who use like Arch Linux and stuff. And they'll be like, oh, I have to write. Uh, I need to fix my macro that I wrote to uh, turn down my brightness. It's bugging or something. There's no way. <laughs> Polymar, are you planning to like work at a normal job after you graduate or are you going to go full-time YouTube? I think like going into college, I was like very sure that I was going to like do like software engineering, like, you know, like try and get a job at, like Microsoft, like Amazon, whatever. Because that just seemed to be like the thing to do. Like people tell you if you're interested in like coding, you'll really like software engineering. And I think after my first year of college, I realized that I have way less interest in that than I thought. I think a big thing is like what we were talking about earlier, just like the people in software engineering. It's just, it's not really like people who I feel like are passionate about coding. I don't know. Just not <laughs> something I feel like is yeah. like really like worth my time. Uh, there's like probably better things I could do with like coding than like make like Netflix's like login screen or whatever, whatever <laughs> goes on. I don't know. <laughs> I know someone that does like coding for enterprise software for Microsoft. And if I hear them talk about their job, I feel so like, wow. Is this your life? I don't know. I would never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can like respect like Silicon Valley and stuff because I feel like it like has opened so many opportunities for like so many people. One of the closest things, I mean, I wouldn't say like Silicon Valley is like a meritocracy. Like there's probably a lot of corruption stuff. But it's like one of those things where like if you like put in the work, I think anyone can like learn how to code and like get a really good job that way. I feel like for someone like me, like, I don't know, it just doesn't really appeal to me. I feel like I've been following you when you were like not super popular yet so i feel like a true fan saying this but i feel i mean you got a good thing going when i was gonna graduate i thought like okay time to to pick myself up by my bootstraps and like may you're a real game developer and i started applying for like triple a and double a and whatever and stuff i didn't get into any of them and i'm so glad i didn't because it's so stupid obviously i just want to make my own games right right yeah and i think it's the same for you you know obviously you have a super good thing going I mean, I think you could just keep it going, to be fair. Do you want to stick with YouTube or do you want to try to like have big hit games or some indie game at some point? I guess my like plan, sort of what I have been thinking about is like, I want to keep doing like what I'm doing, like making videos, like just throughout uh, while I'm still in school, which is like a big reason why I started my like second channel, just because I think a big thing for me is, was that I genuinely like never thought I could do YouTube as like a full-time job just because it took me so much time to make like a singular video. I'd spend like months on a video and like they would do like pretty well, but like not well enough to justify like spending months on a video. It really never crossed my mind. But like now with my like second channel and stuff and like streaming, I feel like for the first time, I'm like pretty happy with YouTube. It's not like a burnout, like stress thing anymore. I feel like for the first time, it like could actually be like a real career. So I think that is like short term something I definitely want to focus on. But then the hard thing is like trying to picture like, okay, then where will I be in like five years? Will I still be just like making like scratch videos or whatever? It feels kind of um, yeah. underwhelming. So I think it would be cool to go into like making games or like some kind of like uh, similar venture. Would be really cool to like actually at some point 
I need to make a proper like long game, Steam game or something. Maybe go from there. But then again, you can just like make a horror game in an hour and like make money off of that. <laughs> and this is maybe what everyone wants to do. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is just making video games because they have to. But you, you know, <laughs> that's definitely my short term plan. Make make some more one hour horror games. I'm inspired by your live stream channel. I'm like, dang, I should be doing it. Like, Let's go. Yeah, I recommend it to like any game developer channel. I think it's such a cool like thing. Yeah, you just stream, do a challenge, and then pay someone to edit it down, and then bam, cool video. Yeah. Yeah, you never know what's gonna like. My one of my most viral videos is just me talking to the Gorilla Tag developer in Gorilla Tag, and it's on my second channel and it has over a million views. <laughs> oh right, right. That was really cool. I love to like interview more multiplayer devs in their games you should interview the you only move a guy oh i gotta play that that looks really fun it's so good it's so fun i think i will you know being surrounded by youtubers all the time in this podcast when it, when we hit 100 episodes i will make a youtube video yes <laughs> that way i definitely do not have to do it let's see favorite youtubers go one of my favorite YouTubers is probably, like, Sam Hogan. Like, back when he first, like, blew up. Oh, I feel like yeah. he was just doing something really, like, unique. I feel like, obviously, like, Danny, like, a little bit before him and him, like, really, like, pioneered, like, a huge shift in, like, game dev content. That kind of stuff is just so interesting to me. Just, like, the game dev, like, YouTube niche and how it's changed, like, so much. And, like, the gaps that are still, like, the gaps that are still there and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's always cool to just see, like, people doing something really new and it creating like a huge like wave when my fake multiplayer io video was like going viral i was still getting like notifications on from youtube studio or whatever when like channels with mm-hmm. a few thousand subs or more would like comment or something i remember i got a comment from him on the video and i was like oh yeah it looks like a cool channel and then i like looked at some of his videos he had like three thousand subs and then i saw him like I like looked like a month later and he had like a few hundred thousand and I was like, what? <laughs> what? I had the exact same thing happen to me. I was like subscribed to him like back when he posted like his like, like he did like dev vlogs before that. But I remember when he posted the Minecraft video, like the one that now has like however many million views, the one that like blew up his channel. When he first posted, I think it had like 800 views when I watched it. And I'm like, oh, damn, this is like a pretty good video. I'm surprised it like didn't get like maybe a couple thousand views or something. <laughs> and then I think like, like a few months later, he showed up just on my feed and I clicked on his channel. He had like, I think it was like 30K, but then like the next day he had like 100K and it just kept going. And it was just crazy. It's just crazy how quickly like something can just like, like a, you flip a switch and just like your entire life changes. It's crazy. Yeah, I went from like, that one video took me from 14k to like 70k in like a week yeah that's wild yeah i had like a similar experience i think my first year on youtube i like slowly grew to like a thousand subs just from like posting on like reddit and stuff and then i think after that year i posted like one video that got like a million views i went from like 1k to like 40k or something (laughs) Yeah. But this is always how it is with every social media platform. Same with like my Twitter. I went from like literally fifty-two select like, followers to like three k, like overnight because I made one tweet that hit ten k. The analogy that I like, I think I read this in a book. It's like it's like melting an ice cube where you work toward melting the ice cube, but you don't see any change until it hits like the melting point, and then it like completely melts. It's not linear at all, I guess. True, and th- but there's an always a fear because you always hear about like streamers that have like one viewer and they stream for like ten years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a different thing. I feel like if you don't have any viewers, I don't understand why people will stream for like eight hours. Like there might be better <laughs> things to like maybe like post <laughs> clips or anything like that. But I remember being so depressed in the beginning of Twitter because like you would get like one like on every post you make, and it's like. It's so like, what is the point of me doing this? Why would I spend any effort of my life doing it? And then suddenly it stops and then it's like, okay, this is great. But it's so... Yeah, yeah, that's very true. YouTube, I feel like, is like a little bit better with that because I feel like uh, you're creating like a huge backlog. I guess with like Twitter and stuff, it's different because people don't really go back to your old tweets. But like my mindset, like starting out was like, if I posted a video that I thought was really, really good and it got like not even like a thousand views... I would just be like, okay, well, like, one day, like, the, this video yeah. will, like, have a lot of views. So I'm just like, okay, I'll just keep pushing. What's your opinion on hiding old videos? Personally, all of my videos are still public. 
that's also because I was like a bit of a perfectionist. I feel like I barely, like, I did not post that much. So when I did post a video, it was always a video I was proud of. I can understand like people who are like maybe posting like, a lot more consistently. If if their older videos are really really cringe, like maybe they'd want to. But I don't know. I didn't have that experience really. I do have some cringe videos, but like I can at least see the effort I put into it, so I won't delete it. One of my favorite devs I've recently started following is uh, Simon Dev, who just posts like a lot of like really interesting behind the scenes of like making different algorithms. His uh, noise video is so cool. It's just like here's all these ways you can use noise textures and like what you can do with it. And then like at the end, he like takes some bunch of noise textures and uses it to make this like fleshy mass covered in eyeballs. And it's like just from some noise textures and it's like so cool. This kind of stuff is really cool. I feel like if I did, would do YouTube videos, I would either maybe like get into some stuff like this or I would do anything not actually making a game, just stuff around it. Because I feel like that's kind of missing. There's so many video essays on about movies and stuff but and games, except for, like, I guess Game Maker's Toolkit. There's not a lot of just, like, here's a one who, like, you know, knows how to make games, but instead of, like, boring you with his code, he just talks about some concepts and, like, interesting stuff. Especially from, like, the perspective of an actual game developer. I think there's a lot of, like, game design video essays from, like, gamers and... They're just like, I don't know, it's definitely not the same thing. It's like, do you know Garbage? Oh, yeah, yeah. I really like his format. Nah, he he has such a good thing going for him. I was like very inspired by that. I made like a channel uh, that didn't last long, but I tried that. I just tried like like two minute like commentary videos where I just try to like do really like exaggerated thumbnails. So yeah, some of them, some of them did really well. I'm surprised. Like the format's actually like pretty like OP, short commentary clickbaity ish stuff he's so good at making clickbait so i'm always like <laughs> i always fall for it and then i'm he always has like one thing in his video i really respect him and i also despise him because it's always like i really think you know like this is going to be the video and it's always just he always just says one super tiny thing it's like did you know in a first person game when they look down the scope they look down the scope and it's like wow sick all right next <laughs> video <laughs> i love it it's so funny what was like your strategy when you first started like seriously trying to build youtube I had, like, zero idea what I was doing. I don't think I was ever, like, super serious. Like, I never really expected, like, anything. I think my, like, lifetime YouTube goal was, like, 10K subscribers. I'm like, once I hit 10K, I'll be, like, a big YouTuber. <laughs> what I did was, I think starting out, like, I felt like I didn't know anything about, like, the YouTube algorithm. But, like, I was really interested in, like, Reddit and, like, how to make Reddit post blow up. Nowadays, I, I, I hate Reddit, but, like, it was good, like, advertising. I think, like, the Unity subreddits and stuff. There's, like, a weird, like, delicate balance between, like, you, you have to self-promo, but, like, just do it, like, make it, mask it as much as possible or so the mods don't delete it. So I would do that with, like, all my videos. I would, like, I tried to do videos that I thought would, like, appeal to as many, like, big subreddits as possible. I did a video where I made a game for five different consoles. So I cross-posted that on, like, every console subreddit. I guess I got, like, traffic from that. And then... I think I did, like, I did a PS Vita video because my logic was, like, okay, that's, like, a pretty, like, niche but, like, strong community. So it's, like, a very different approach, like, nowadays because nowadays, like, none of that, like, it was, like, a difference between, like, like, like 10 and, like, 50 views and I guess later it'd be, like, 600 and, like, 1,000 views. So, like, now I guess, like, it's a, I have a very different strategy to that but I guess, like, starting out, that was, like, all I really focused on. I guess basically I didn't really know what I was doing, but eventually I just had a video blow up. And then after that, I kind of like tried to learn how YouTube actually works. I think I had like a similar path of just like posting a lot on Reddit and like slow growth mm. and then trying out different things. And then eventually something blows up. We want to ask about Twitter, play snake. That was huge. I remember on Twitter for a while. That was crazy. I think like to this day, like most of my Twitter followers are from that bot. Yeah, that was just complete luck. I did not expect anything to happen with that. I just wanted to do it for a video. I like really did not know what I was doing. I literally, so what happened was I ran the bot on like IntelliJ. I just, I started the bot like one night just to test it out um, after I set up like the profile and stuff. And then I woke up the next morning and it blew up. So I'm like, oh shoot, I can't like stop the bot now. So I just kept IntelliJ running the the code on my computer it wasn't on a server or anything like that so i just did not turn off my computer for like months it was really bad what <laughs> there was no like saving or anything too so whenever it would crash i'd have to like carefully reconstruct the last game where uh the snake or like to get the right snake this or else people would be like there'd be a mob of people like really angry at me 
people got so into that. It was like, it was actually like one of the like weirdest experiences of my life. That would be my ultimate nightmare, being like studying up like a joke thing or something. Like uh, I make a joke gig in, in like five seconds and I put it on the internet and suddenly like half of the human population is like standing like next to my house wanting me to update the game, I would cry. Yeah, I got some like absolutely crazy DMs. Like I think eventually I just stopped it. It genuinely like people just got way like way into it and they were DMing me saying like, please stop this bot. It's like killing my mental health. So to everyone listening, if you want to go famous, make a Twitter bot. Ah, uh, just kidding. No, the API is like 2000 euros a day. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Now, nowadays that's not possible anymore. You got in there quick. I had been, I remember before I saw that I'd been thinking about like doing a Twitter bot game for like a roguelike or something and it would display it all in text, but I had no idea how to do the input for it. And I was like, I don't know, maybe they like vote on different commands or like i don't know random roll and then i saw what you did and it's like snake you just retweet or like to change the direction i was like oh this is so simple and like so well made like this is this is how you do it like okay yeah yeah i think the like control scheme was like a it was very simple because i have i've like seen bots like that before where like it uses poles and stuff and they don't like always like blow up as much but yeah i guess just like the very simple control scheme like very simple branding it forces people to retweet and probably helps it's like the thing where it's like if it's an image that says please like this image like it works for some reason and this is like the next level of this you know it's like to make this thing work like a retweet it's probably against like tos for sure but <laughs> it's all good the, the coolest thing i've ever seen i think on twitter with like api stuff is someone who managed to do with like i don't know how they did it but with some kind of embedding trick or something, they were able to do run like an actual game in Twitter itself. Oh, I think I saw that at some point. That was super cool. I really wish there was a social media platform where you could do this, because I would love to make just like a five minute game to, and post it as a tweet. That would be super cool. That would be so cool, yeah. I remember at one point I tried out this like weird app. It was a pretty like small app, but it was like basically like a TikTok format, but for games. It had like a built-in game editor and you post them and you can like scroll through games. Uh, oh, to yeah. play them. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty interesting idea. If I bought Twitter, I would add this feature. That that would be a really cool thing. We did a collab basically on that one video you did making Python or a Python game or something. Oh, yeah. It was like you asked me to react or play the games and react to them. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I just played through with the most like dull voice. And I was like, oh, yeah, here's my thoughts. All right, see ya. And then <laughs> you're like, can you say which ones we thought was better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you did the same thing and Jonas reacted to the video. And I was like, oh, this is how you react to a video, <laughs> to a game. And like, I couldn't imagine. I was like, you must have been suffering trying to make that into an interesting video. <laughs> I, like, I, I actually liked it. I actually thought it turned out well. I definitely like didn't explain it at all. I don't know. I felt <laughs> I felt weird. I didn't want to like message you being like, Hey, can you decide uh, which game deserves one thousand dollars? Yeah, that was a fun video. That video was like pretty inspired by your like four game devs, like one art kit thing. Because I feel like collabs like that, like people, re like a lot of people would watch like uh, those videos when you post them. I feel like there's a lot of potential for like people just like to see like competition stuff. I feel like yeah, it's just so much work to do now. So I haven't done them in a while, but. I guess it's more like I just want to make games that I'm going to sell and get paid for. <laughs> it's like, and then I'm like, I don't want to put a month into a game I can't sell. Yeah, there's less point for you to make videos, I guess, when you can like work on your games and everything. Yeah, but one day I'll go back to it. Polymars, if you ever get sponsorships, just become like the um, the Mr. Beast of like video game <laughs> videos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At one point, this was like last, I think it was like last winter. Um, I went through this like huge phase from like, okay, I really want to be like, I want to be Mr. Beast of game development, like, like literally what you said. And that was, that was when I filmed, I think the newest video on my main channel is like anything you code, I'll pay for. And uh, <laughs> it's such like a, it's such a weird, uh, video. And after I filmed it, like it took me like so long to edit. Cause I just realized like, okay, I really don't want to, I really don't want to be the Mr. Beast of game. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was a bad idea. 
I like that the regret wasn't like spending the money, but more like having to do the editing. <laughs> and I also realized like if someone watches Mr. Beast, they're probably not gonna click on a video called like anything you code. Like there's like a weird <laughs> um, mismatch of like content and like style. You should make a video like. I paid this game developer a living wage to make a game for me. This would be a really good <laughs> concept, I think. <laughs> a very novel idea for the gaming industry. Uh, you want to promote anything, Polymars? Subscribe to Yeah, I Make Games. Subscribe to Polymars and Polymars Plus Plus. Wait, what was your live channel? That's your live channel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that too. Do that actually before you subscribe to Yeah, I Make Games. All right, good having you on. Yes, thanks for having me. That was a lot of fun. Good talks. Yeah, this was fun. See you all next time. Bye. Thank you, guys. See you.